Welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Leia Mondragon. And I'm Nathan, and here's a look at today's stories. The fight against the specter of fracking pipeline continues in New York and New Jersey. Activists take on the world's richest man with an action at Saks Fifth Avenue. Protesters against nuclear weapons and energy observe the anniversary of bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We'll interview one of the victims of pepper spraying cop Anthony Bologna. And continuing our look at local people doing good work, we'll profile the group Just Food and visit the historical solar house of Flatbush, Brooklyn. Thursday, August 9th, kicked off a series of protests against the Spectra Energy Corporation's construction of a pipeline to carry natural gas extracted by fracking to the harbors of New York City. Objections to the pipeline have been raised on both sides of the Hudson River. Jersey City Mayor Jeremiah Healy has expressed concerns about the pipeline's close proximity to sensitive areas and has argued that it could hurt future commercial and residential development in the city. There is a danger that the Spectra pipeline will bring in radon gas. Radon is a radioactive gas that is produced whenever gas is extracted. It travels with the gas through pipelines to the point of use. According to the Surgeon General, radon gas is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the nation today. Spectra Energy, a company with an historically bad track record for safety issues, is, ironically, excluded from regulations of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. This might not be as pressing of a problem if the pipelines weren't in such a densely populated area as ours. The pipeline would start in the West Village at the Gansvort Peninsula, 300 feet away from a toddler's playground in the heart of downtown Manhattan. There is a real danger of explosions. In September of 2010, in San Bruno, California, a faulty pipeline caused a smaller pipeline of similar pressure to explode. The blast destroyed 38 homes, killed 8, and injured 51 people. The president of the International Association of Firefighters, Local 1064, has said that a failure of the Spectra pipeline would have staggering ramifications for a major population center. Compounding the grievances of residents, the fracked gas is not even intended for local consumption, but is for export only, according to the SANE Energy Project. This is only the beginning of a number of actions aimed to raise awareness and hopefully put a stop to the construction of the pipeline. Updates of the event will be viewable on our website at www.occupypublicaccesstv.com. On Tuesday, August 7th, Mexican activists joined members of Occupy Wall Street and rallied outside Saks Fifth Avenue under the coalition Two Countries, One Voice to protest against the predatory business model of Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim. The four-day protest is an effort to raise awareness of Slim's monopolistic activities, which created his fortune at the expense of Mexico's working class. According to Forbes magazine, Slim is the richest man in the world, with a value of over $69 billion. The magnate's fortune comes mainly from his virtual monopoly over the landline and cell phone market in Mexico with Telmex holding 80% of the home phone market and America Mobile 70% of the cell phone market. Slim also profits from the high tariffs charged to Mexicans abroad to call, to call back home. In a report published by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Mexicans were overcharged $13.4 billion a year from 2005 to 2006 for their phone and internet services. Slim's empire expands beyond the borders of Mexico. He holds assets in Central and South America, as well as in the United States. Owning shares in the New York Times, as well as Saks Fifth Avenue, where he is the largest stakeholder, with 16% of the shares. Some media, such as New York Magazine, have reported that Mexican student movement Yo Soy Centro 32 would back the action. However, the group whose name in English means I am number 132 retracted their support. In a press release, Yo Soy Ciento 32 states that they withheld their participation in the rally because they knew members of U.S. Democratic Party would be present and that would interfere with their neutral political stance. According to other media, such as the citizen blog Pulso Ciudadano, some of the Mexican activists were part of Morena, the Movement of National Regeneration, a group known to support left-wing Mexican presidential candidate Andres Manuel López Obrador the main rival of President-elect Enrique Peña Nieto. 
Let's have a look at the protest in New York. One percent, yeah, your kingdom must calm down. One percent, your kingdom must calm down. Well, I heard the voice of the people, they were saying, one percent, your kingdom must calm down. This, this building here is like a staple of the 1%. It's the most famous 1% shopping mall, shopping plaza in the world. Everyone knows it. So we want folks who would otherwise shop here to know who owns part of this establishment. And it turns out that Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire, the world's wealthiest man, Warren Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, they're like stepchildren to, to Carlos Slim. He's made his money overcharging the entire country and communities in our own city. So imagine all of the families that have to call back home throughout Mexico, throughout Latin America. They're making phone calls and they're being charged rates that are lining the pocket of Carlos Slim and draining money out of our own New York City economy, let alone his own country. We have a war on the on, a war of drugs on the front lines. We have people complaining about lack of economic development, driving illegal immigration. Well, this is a person who's made his money pillaging poverty. He even says that poverty is opportunity. So, New Yorkers, Americans, he owns the largest single private stakeholder of Saxon Avenue. He owns over 8% interest in the New York Times and he's influencing our own economy. We need 100% of the people who are, who are around. We need folks with resources who would otherwise shop here to say, yeah, we're not down with that type of business model. It is not just profit over people. So we're calling solidarity, raising, raising awareness, and uh, we're gonna go shopping in Saks Fifth Avenue in a few minutes. Every boy and girl, Carlos, your kingdom must come down. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, Japan. And three days later, on August 9th, dropped another atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki. In total, it is estimated that at least 150,000 people died as a result of the two bombings. On Monday, August 6th, Occupy Nukes and other anti-nuclear protesters held a die-in protest at Manhattan's Rockefeller Center to demand an end to nuclear weapons proliferation and production. Dressed in black to symbolize charred bodies, the protesters howled in pain before falling to the ground in a simulation of death. The protest was held in front of the headquarters of General Electric. Five of the six nuclear reactors that melted down in March 2011 in Fukushima, Japan, were designed by General Electric. Other protests occurred on the same day at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, where the bomb was developed, and at the Kitsnap Bangor Naval Base in Puget Sound in Washington, which is home to eight nuclear-powered submarines which carry nuclear missiles. At an annual ceremony in Hiroshima on August 6th, Harry Truman's grandson, Clifton Truman Daniel, said, 
it's now my responsibility to do all I can to make sure we never use nuclear weapons again. U.S. Ambassador John Roos also attended the ceremony in Hiroshima. The United States remains the only country in the world to have ever used nuclear weapons in war. GE is currently seeking permission to build a new uranium enrichment facility in Wilmington, North Carolina, pending approval by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. A common belief is that if the U.S. had not dropped the atomic bombs, a ground invasion of Japan would have been necessary. The rationale goes on to presume that this ground invasion would have caused more death and destruction than the bombings. However, many officials' figures have stated otherwise, including Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet during World War II, and Admiral William D. Leahy, Truman's Chief of Staff. Leahy wrote that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. We're out here today just to bring attention to the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and in three days Nagasaki. And we just want to reiterate the, the craziness of how our government is spending massive amounts to keep the fossil fuel industries in business. In the past 10 years, the trillions of dollars that have been spent to support nuclear energy more so than all what we're spending on health, on education, on any kind of um, alternative energies. And it's just so out of balance and we're concerned that, that it's rigged, that the fossil fuel industries are the ones keeping this all going. We need their subsidies to be stopped and we want solar energy. Nuclear energy is uh, is safe. It's clean. It is neither safe nor clean. There have been innumerable leaks, radiation leaks, which cause cancer in nuclear power plants throughout the world. We have to shut down the Fukushima as possible, as early as, early as possible. Tell me what's happening in Fukushima. It's uh, ridiculous. Uh, it is no coincidence that the material out of which nuclear weapons are made is called plutonium because Pluto is the god of hell and today hell was opened up for the people of the world. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people, mostly civilians, were murdered in Hiroshima and hundreds of thousands more were radiated right into the third and fourth generation. And I had the bitter privilege of visiting and working with the uh, Ibakusha, they are called. These are the burnt people. These are the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was a heartbreaking but powerful experience to meet with these people, many of whom are deformed, terribly burnt, and others simply are suffering from all kinds of forms of exotic cancer which they are passing on to their children, and many of whom, because of their suffering and the feeling that all life is over for them, decided instead to dedicate their lives to making sure that nuclear weapons would never be used again. Last week, we brought you stories of pepper spraying cops being brought to justice in California and New York. This week, we speak with Damien Crisp, one of the OWS activists who is suing NYPD officer Anthony Bologna for firing pepper spray at demonstrators during a march to Union Square on September 24th. The NYPD determined that Bologna had violated departmental guidelines and docked him 10 days vacation after the incident occurred last year. Now, the police department has taken the unusual step of refusing to defend Bologna in a lawsuit over the incident. Our correspondent spoke with Damien Crisp to find out more about what happened that day and why he is suing. Here's what he had to say about the case. We had, uh, we had marched up to Union Square, uh, if you remember, and 
uh, leaving Union Square, heading back to Zuccotti Park, um, the police changed their tactic and uh, suddenly there were these sort of orange nettings were brought out. Um, the first time I had seen them and, and people were pushed to the left, pushed to the right, people sort of randomly thrown down and arrested. And um, It seemed like a way to, um, to sort of break up the crowd, like with, with a certain amount of violence. Um, so we made a we made a um, turn onto University Place, and we were walking down the sidewalk, and um, sort of in the middle of the block, we met with another orange netting that cut me off from my girlfriend at the time. So she was on one side, and I was on the other side, and um, she eventually got roped into the netting, and and. So we found ourselves standing there, maybe 10 or 15 people within this, the netting. Um, in front of us, people were, uh, who seemed to be journalists were, were sort of beaten, thrown to the ground. There, there were all sorts of little incidents in front of us, outside of the net. And then at some point, someone inside the net was grabbed and ripped over the net and, and uh, thrown into the street. and, and um, so it was a scene where suddenly the NYPD had just created like a massive amount of pretty violent like social uh, upheaval. I would I would describe it as. Um. And of course, we just learned last week of the official departure of Lieutenant John Pike, another infamous pepper spraying cop, who was caught on video pepper spraying peacefully demonstrating students at UC Davis at very close range in a video that went completely viral and was seen around the world. Do you see a connection between the departure of John Pike, who we just learned has officially left the um, campus police force at UC Davis after being on eight months paid administrative leave and the, what's happening here with the NYPD refusing to pay Anthony Bologna's legal fees? I mean, I, I see two different connections. One, the, the, uh, the, the motivation or maybe sort of the, like the allowance to do that, what made him feel like he was, he was justified in doing that. Um, I think that's a broader issue. It's a, it's a social issue and it, and it has to do with um, what we allow in American society, um, that we are, you know, moving closer and closer to wanting security over freedoms. And, uh, and we see, you know, how the American public sees, you know, how the military operates, um, torture, legal detention, ignoring human rights. And I, I can't help but think that, you know, the pool, that's in the, at least the subconscious of the mind of anyone who is either doing security or is a police officer or has some kind of power uh, in that regard. Um, at the same time, in our system, which has been so corrupted by money, I, I do think that the legal system, uh, the justice system, is sort of our one... It's our, it's our one place t to, to find recourse. Uh, I, I've seen that throughout Occupy, you know. Uh, it goes back and forth, and it depends on who the judges are and who the lawyers are in the situation, but there's still um, sort of, uh, there, there still is, you know, justice is still possible, I feel like. What role do you think the video of the incident that so many people have seen on YouTube has played or will play as this case goes forward? Most of my role in Occupy was, uh, I was a writer before it began and an artist, and I do a lot of writing online, and I, I had a, an audience that I could go back to and report about Occupy online, So and uh, also a lot of photography that I did. Um, so, you know, um, that's that's one way you know I guess what I'm trying to say is, is is online is probably the blood of Occupy you know and uh, these memes and these sort of viral moments of things that happen within Occupy I think are very important um, and I know and you probably know this too that 
the week after the pepper spray incident, the, it seemed to double or, or triple the, the crowd that came to Zuccotti. So for the people watching at home or, you know, other activists in the movement, is there anything else that you want people to know about what happened to you and your participation or the NYPD's actions? Sure. I mean, um, you know, something I hear a lot, and, and because I am, you know, a bit public with my thoughts, is, you know, people, will, and they're free to do so, will say, well, you know, you were just moaning, you know, you were just pepper sprayed and you weren't. You know, this or you weren't that, or and um, you know maybe maybe you shouldn't have been protesting or, or whatever. Maybe you shouldn't have been with this group. Or, um, but the fact is, uh, it was a nonviolent protest. It was a nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, you know, we didn't ask for a permit because you don't ask the system that you're protesting for a permit. Um, but uh, I just want everyone to know that um, uh, that Occupy has a good heart, and everything I've ever seen, uh, there was never a reason for any kind of police brutality. The Center for Popular Economics held their summer institute this past week at Columbia University with workshops on alternative banking, media justice, financial justice, housing as a right, participatory budgeting, immigrant-led worker cooperatives, solidarity economies, and more. The theme for this year's institute was economics for the 99%, and the week of studies finished up with a, a Brooklyn tour which included visits to the Park Slope Food Co-op, Occupy, and the Brooklyn Commons, a collaborative space on Atlantic Avenue striving to be the home for various alternative economic enterprises. The Brooklyn Commons is also one of the lesser known incubators for the Occupy movement, where nonviolent trainers held workshops in civil disobedience for the scores of activists pouring into New York into the days leading up to the September 17th actions on Wall Street last year. Occupy Public Access TV's correspondent James Green caught up with Karen Washington of Just Food in the Bronx, who was at the Summer Institute to talk about how we can take back our food system. I'm part of La Familia Verde, which is a community garden coalition, also Bugs, Black Urban Growers, and Just Food. We were asked to do a presentation, and our topic was the color of food, and we talked about the issue of food and how it has transcended um, different immigrant groups and also the effect that food has in my neighborhood. I live in a low-income neighborhood, and I got a chance to talk about the color of food in my neighborhood. We talk about food justice. We have to look, over, look at our agricultural system. If it's supposed to be sustainable, then food should be a right for all and not a privilege for some. And so that's what you're starting to see. You're starting to see better food in high-end neighborhoods. In my neighborhood, we have junk food. So if we're talking about leveling the playing field and we're talking about a fair and just food system, then food, healthy food, should be a right for all. And so we're talking about some of the problems that are in our neighborhood, and there's a lot of it is based on economics, wealth, and racism. And so we're here to sort of dispel some of the myths around food, but also to educate people around food and what they can do to make a difference. Our food system is controlled by a handful of corporations. We're beings of people in the whole world. So we have to make a difference. We have to start taking back our food system. And so what you're starting to see in small pockets across this country is that people are starting to grow food in their front yards, their backyards, their windowsills, their terraces, all in the name of food justice. And so hopefully I won't be standing here 10 years from now talking about food justice, but talking about an economy that's run by the people for the people. Bugs is black urban growers. We started the first Black Farmers and Urban Gardener Conference back in 2010, and as a result of looking at the food system, seeing the numbers of black farmers that were diminishing, and if we didn't do anything and educate people around food, we felt that by 20 years from now, there would be no black farmers. So we started this organization to just put it out there, the disparity, the, the disparity we saw in terms of food amongst people of color, especially black farmers. And so we started this organization, Bugs, Black black urban growers to bring awareness to the fact that we need more black farmers, that's number one, but also to look at our communities around our education, economics, and wealth. 
Well, I was part of the Occupied Farming sort of collaborative that they did a couple of months ago, and I really like the movement. I mean, it's going to come from us. It's not going to come from that 1%. I mean, we are the 99%. We should be out there really taking back our land, really talking about the social justice aspect around food, around our economy, around our wealth, and it starts with us. So, you know, I'm on board with the Occupy movement, and it shouldn't be just in terms of, of, of economics, but just look at wealth, let's look at housing, let's look at education, let's look at the whole system as a whole and take back this country. The owner of one of the oldest solar-powered homes is being threatened with eviction. Jerome Johnson, a local Brooklynite living in Flatbush, is fighting to stay in his home. But this is no ordinary home. It boasts some of the first tinkerings to create energy-efficient housing, with solar-powered water heating modules on the roof, solar ovens, walls insulated with recycled materials, and an archive of records dating back decades documenting the entire process. At one point, the building was an informal school where neighborhood kids would come to learn about solar power and the environment. In his living room stands a large and almost unidentifiable machine. When asked about it, Mr. Johnson explains that it's a solar oven with the capacity to pasteurize water. He complains the outbreaks of cholera in Haiti could be prevented with such a machine, since it would eliminate the need for chucking in clean water from far away. He stresses the reason many of his inventions have not taken off are because his focus has been on inexpensive solutions, which rely on materials that are usually discarded. And so, there's little money to be made from them. From egg containers glued together to form sheets of insulation, to tuna fish cans soldered together in rows and installed within glass to store heat, the house appears more like a science museum than a residence. He now faces the risk of losing his home. The city claims he owes years of unpaid water taxes and accused him of removing his own water meter. Mr. Johnson insists the building never had a water meter and that the city is making up excuses to confiscate his home. Surviving mostly on Social Security benefits and without the ability to pay for a lawyer, he says his attempts to work out a way to stay in his home have all been unsuccessful. He seems less worried about what will happen to him than to all the valuable history that's being stored in every room, on bookshelves and in boxes. Mr. Johnson will be opening his home on Sunday mornings in August as a way for people to see the building for themselves. He hopes that people will connect with each other and find ways to make use of the building. One possibility is the construction of a greenhouse right in the home with help from upstate farmers. Occupy Brooklyn TV met with Jerome Johnson to hear his story and get a tour of the house. Take a look. Gets hot, comes out here. So this unit makes this room, which has no heat, in the winter, 70 degrees outside it's 30. But this does it. If you put your hand, you feel it's hot. We're always into this friggin' world where we're living in a world of Whoa, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. And government, God bless them. They want you to end up throwing everything out, including your grandma, if you could, because they'd want that apartment so they can end up renovating it to make it a high-tech operation. And me, my reputation was low-tech, hands-on, do-it-yourself. I was nurturing what this old house on Channel 13 was doing. I wrote to them. And we were doing what they were doing around the country. We were making this building, and it was called this old house. Yeah. So we were taking just a typical old house, showing people what to do every weekend, and the purpose was simple. There's a recession. People are dying, don't have any money. So you go, you, you, you're dying and you don't have enough money to make your home energy efficient, but you're going to hire somebody for $3,000 to do it, right? No. You know how to use your hands? You can use a pair of scissors, cut it some fiberglass and shove it in the wall. You know how to use plastic? Cut it. Put it on a window. Oh, it's not, not beautiful, but guess what? For the winter, it'll save you fuel. I'd like you to look at a few things only so that you get a basic background. The, the solar house. This is when I was in the lighting field. What is this machine? This is a solar food cooker that I developed for Africa and for Haiti. And I couldn't get any colleges involved with it. I mean, you make phone calls, but you know, I don't have the damn patience to be like a, a business. I'm not trying to sell it. You think if you can talk to people and you tell them what you're doing, 
then they're gonna send somebody over. Come, let's see this. The food goes in here, sits on the shelf. This focuses the heat right here. And it's a takeoff. This is what was at the United Nations. Umbrella. This is the food cooker. There's a handle, the tray over here, and it cooks the food. This is what I had them in Africa duplicating. Not as a manufacturing perfection, but any way you could, you could make it. So with the Haitian problem and the other problem in Africa, I came up with another version that could be made anywhere and as I kept building things, and since nobody had it before, people said, oh, you're an inventor. Oh, you mean when you make something that nobody ever had before, so you invent it? Well, to me, that was just being creative to solve a problem. Can you tell me what this is? Stone. A little, a little wood stone. At, at a lot of the Occupy camps, people were trying to build these um, experimental um, projects to showcase different, um, you know, energy use uh, That's right. activities. And, and at a particular meeting, I opened my mouth. We'll capture the heat from the gasoline generators that are making the electricity until they were confiscated. But I figured if we took the exhaust heat and had water warmed by it, then the water could be through a hose laying on the ground, into your tent, out to the next tent, so the, your, your, your ground cover and your bedroll on top of the water that's warm would heat you. Tell us from the beginning again, what is happening to your house? Why are, tell us about how they're going to take away the house and, and that you're you know, you want to fight it with all... I don't know how to fight it anymore. I have no one that you can sit and take a document that you have to even read it anymore. There are so many documents that... And if and even an attorney, you give it to them, I'll take care of it later. And you know they're not going to do it. So if they don't want to even read the document so they get emotionally involved and therefore they want to fight because they got the actual proof, then you know it's a game that's going on. What justification are they giving for taking the house? They don't have to have a justification. They can take what they want. The sadness is that you're looking at things that like, well, it's painful. Right there is dated 1898. It's written to my grandfather. It's signed by John Quincy Adams. The whole world is garbage, garbage, garbage. And if there's garbage, let's recycle the garbage. What, what do you think about, you know, a movement like Occupy or civil disobedience to um, stop, uh, you know, the onslaught of oil and um, climate change? Do you... Is that something that you approve of or you think that is... Uh... I'll tell you what I'm willing to do. You find a place to take these cans that are right up your feet. See them? Bring them to your garage so they're out of this room with a couple of other things. And we'll occupy this house and have all the research work of all these mines. That's, oh, we've got an idea. Let's do it. Because that's all we were doing here. I didn't end up creating all these. It was the people coming on the weekends. This became an incubator. You came, looking around, talking. Did you ever think of doing this? Boom, the blackboard. Jesus, that looks like a good idea. Thank you for watching <laughs> Occupy Broken TV. I'm Leia Mondragon. And I'm Nathan. See you next week. <laughs>